Provostan Vice Principal, Deputy Pro Chancellor, graduates, graduands, and guests. Before us today stands one who, having made more than 500 media appearances in the past five years, made countless speaking presentations, and written widely on aspects of the experience and realities of justice in this country and elsewhere, is probably one of the best known lawyers in the land. And deservedly so, for Nazir Afzal is someone who has probably done more than any to lift the lid and raise the profile of those grossly underreported, little discussed, largely invisible, but all too harmful crimes of violence against women and girls, of forced marriage, so called honour crimes, and FGM. All the more remarkable is the fact that Nazir Afzal is not the lead spokesperson for a legal rights charity, nor head of a leading chamber of barristers specialising in such criminal casework, but a public servant within the Crown Prosecution Service of England and Wales. And this is an organisation which from its formation has tended to shun the headlines and to operate with a distinctly low public profile. It's an organisation whose offices have mostly been discreetly located out of the public gaze, and which, when pressed to provide comment on its decisions or on the outcomes of court cases that it has prosecuted, has usually resorted to the short, factual, anonymous and suitably diplomatic civil service type response. But Nazir Afzal has done it rather differently. And he has prosecuted more than a few cases of notoriety and cases where there has been strong public interest, including the stalker of Diana, Princess of Wales in 1996, the honour killing of Samira Nazir in 2005, the Rochdale sex trafficking case in 2012, and most recently the trial of former BBC presenter Stuart Hall. He even conducted a prosecution in front of Her Majesty the Queen in 2002, the only time that Her Majesty has been in a British courtroom, this being in her jubilee year when she was invited to the Royal Courts of Justice to observe a case being heard before the Lord Chief Justice no less. Afterwards, Nazir had, was introduced to the Royal Guest and had the opportunity to discuss the finer points of the case with Her Majesty. And I'm delighted to say that Nazir is a graduate of this university's School of Law and has therefore been in this great hall before. It's an absolute pleasure to welcome him back and also to his mother, Shabibi, and two brothers, Noor and Akbar, to share in Nazir's very special day. Nazir's story is a remarkable one. Having risen to the rank of regional chief prosecutor for the Northwest and been the most senior Muslim in this service, from the modest beginnings of a family newly arrived in Birmingham from the lawless northwest frontier of Pakistan. That was just a year before Nazir's birth in 1962, his father having served as a caterer for the British Army in his native country. Nazir, one of six children, was also the first in the family to attend school at Marlborough Junior School in Small Heath where sadly, but not untypical of the times, he had to endure much bullying and racial abuse. He recalls coming home and hiding his torn clothing from his parents because he didn't want them to know what was going on. But he was clearly a very bright pupil, passing his 11 plus and progressing to Waverley Grammar School in the same locality, where he did very well, culminating in his candidature for six A-levels, including physics, chemistry, pure maths and statistics. His horizons, however, were always quite local, and so although he included London University on his UCAS form, he never seriously imagined his higher education being other than in Birmingham. His parents wanted him to be a doctor, and in a few minutes, he will. <laughs> but he dutifully applied for medicine at Birmingham, but actually he was far more attracted to law when the offer came, he had no hesitation in accepting his place in the Faculty of Law here at Birmingham. And he enjoyed the next four years immensely. The first year lodging in High Hall and thereafter was in rented flats in Selly Oak. He valued his legal studies and recalls with appreciation the stimulating courses he took, particularly on criminal justice and criminal law, provided by Professors Roger Lang, these days at Warwick, John Baldwin, now Emeritus Professor, 
Keith Huff, now visiting lecturer in residence, and our own presenter, Professor Andrew, um, sorry, Andrew Sanders, <laughs> forgive me. <laughs> But he was also much attracted to the life in the Guild of Students and to the student politics of the period. He participated in a number of student demonstrations against the higher education policies of the government of the time, including a protest day in London outside Parliament. In his second year, he was successful in being elected to the office of Vice President of the Guild, which provided him with a sabbatical year from his law studies. And this he greatly enjoyed and realised he wanted something rather more in his future career than simply being a legal practitioner. Something that would involve him in working in the public arena and in developing a strong personal profile as well. On the downside at Birmingham, he has told me how twice he had a near-death experience during his student days. First, when he choked, or nearly choked, on an onion bargee that he was consuming in Selly Oak High Street late one Saturday night. Probably the less said about that incident, the better. The second, however, happened in his vice presidential year, when he played a leading part in a student demonstration about funding cuts. The plan was to parade a coffin, symbolising the death of education, around the central campus. Nazir offered to be the one who would lie in the lidless coffin to be transported solemnly at head height by a group of colleagues acting as his pallbearers. And the cortege made its way across University Square, then up the steps of the library where the coffin was lifted up into a near vertical position for the benefit of the crowd below. Nazir still remembers with horror his realisation that he was now in mortal danger of being pitched out of his sarcophagus and down the 20 or so foot drop to the hard brick walkway below. Happily, his cries were heard just in time and the coffin was drawn back to safety. Life became a little calmer in his final year as he had completed his degree and then proceeded to Guildford Law School for a further year of study, now for his Law Society finals. But then he returned to Birmingham for articles with the firm Glaziers, during which his experience of undertaking probate work and company law furthered his appreciation of the fact that what he really was interested in was criminal casework. By now, he was also attracted to the idea of working in London. So when he happened to see an advert for a job in the Crown Prosecution Service in the capital, prosecuting in Bow Street and Horse Ferry Road Magistrates Courts, he saw the opportunity of his future. And the role suited him very well, with the steady stream of mundane, pretty, petty crime cases interspersed with the excitement of a court appearance by more than a few high-profile and celebrity defendants, all adding to the human interest aspects of his criminal prosecution work. Indeed, he began to gain something of a reputation for himself as a prosecutor, with the knack of identifying and focusing in his prosecutions on aspects that others had perhaps not spotted or thought sufficiently relevant. For example, when he was presented with a challenge of prosecuting a case of gross indecency, of a couple accused of having sex on a train, he chose to draw attention to the evidence that the defendants had ended their business by lighting up a cigarette thereby committing a further offence, that of smoking on a non-smoking compartment. <laughs> and this indeed was a case that later provided the storyline for a TV sketch by Victoria Wood. Perhaps some of you have seen it. Nazir also successfully prosecuted a case involving the very first ear print, left by the defendant as he listened for signs of occupancy of the dwelling he was about to burgle. And there was, as mentioned, the much publicised case of the stalker of Diana, Princess of Wales, the accused being a German surgeon, Klaus Wagner, but against whom the charges were dropped by Nazir on grounds that the psychiatric assessments showed him to be deluded and needing medical help. He was also one of the first prosecuting solicitors to be made a Crown Court advocate, able to prosecute cases in the higher courts, and he was quickly promoted to assistant chief for CPS West London. And it was here that he also began to focus his attentions on aspects of criminal activity that he saw as too often escaping justice. He organised a conference, for example, on crime in sport, the first of its kind, highlighting drug taking and substance misuse. He did similarly for airport crime and for stalking. And he was also moved to take action to raise the profile of the shockingly low reporting and prosecution rates for violence against women and girls, the dearth of prosecutions for forced marriages, 
for so-called honour-based violence and killings and the appalling prevalence among some communities of the practice of female genital mutilation. Without a doubt, the attention and profile at last being given to such crimes owes much to Nazir's brave stance, to his preparedness to set precedents and not to surrender to the pressures of political correctness or fears of appearing racist. Instead, he has recognised the need for a fundamental culture change in the criminal justice sector to raise public confidence that the reporting of such victimisation is indeed worthwhile and will simply not result in additional stress or further personal harm. His speaking out and writing about crimes of violence, particularly as I say, against women and girls, have also done much to make the Crown Prosecution Service as an organisation more open and publicly engaging. In 2010, he was promoted again, now to Chief Prosecutor for the North West Region of England and Wales, one of 13 regional directorships and the largest outside London. And here he's continued his mission to raise the profile of the CPS and to champion more assertively the plight and needs of victims of crime. Visibility is a key objective for him and he has devoted much time to getting out and about in his region, presenting himself and his messages and building stronger public accountability. In the past five years, he's spoken on radio and television programmes repeatedly. He also undertakes a considerable amount of community and charitable work, serving as a trustee of several charities, including Way Out Dreams Foundation and the Henna Foundation. He chairs the Prince of Wales' Mosaic Trust in the North West, and he's a founding trustee of the Centre for Muslim Affairs. He's also a tutor for Common Purpose and Young Foundations, offering development programmes for the country's emerging leaders and he acts as an ambassador for the Kids Task Force. And he's developed a storyline for a DVD for children and young people on extremism and faith and on bullying and youth crime. And this has gone out to every secondary school in the region with guidance for teachers on how they might facilitate pupil discussions. Provost and Vice Principal, such work with local communities as well as his contribution within the Crown Prosecution Service was recognised in the award of an OBE in 2005 New Year's Honours List. Two years later, he was nominated both as CPS Public Servant of the Year and as Legal Personality of the Year by the Society of Asian Lawyers. He's also listed in the Muslim Power 100 list as one of the most influential and leading Muslims in the UK. And it seems entirely fitting, therefore, that this great university, his university, in the city of his childhood, should add to this CV of distinction by recognising his exceptional contribution to the practice of law and justice through the award of an honorary degree today. So to you and to the university, I present Nazir Afsal, deemed worthy to be awarded the degree of Doctor of Laws, honoris causa. <laughs> by, vir by virtue of my authority as Provost and Vice Principal, I deem you, I declare you Doctor of Laws of the University of Birmingham. Honoris causa. <laughs> Many congratulations. I didn't recognise that person. Uh, Deputy Pro Chancellor, Provost, Vice Principal, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, graduates, graduates, guests, parents, mum. Uh, absolutely delighted uh, to have the opportunity uh, to say a few words to you, and I'm absolutely grateful uh, to Professor Rain and others uh, who have uh, said some amazingly kind words about me and the work that I've been doing. Uh, it is uh, phenomenal to be able to come back to the university I graduated from 27 years ago. I sat not far from where you're sitting, I'm pretty sure. Uh, my mother was here then, my father, who's passed now, was here. Uh, we had a phenomenal day. I'd forgotten all about it until I came back today. Uh, and uh, it is the greatest day of your life to now. It gets better. 
Uh, my journey, uh, you've heard a great deal from Professor Rain uh, about my journey. Yes, we came from the northwest frontier of Pakistan, the traditional and tribalistic part of Pakistan. Uh, they came here. I was born in Birmingham, the traditional and tribalistic Birmingham. Uh, I was given the opportunities that they lacked. Uh, we had, um, you can imagine, that's the part of the world where Malala was shot in the head because she wanted an education. It's not a place where you would have the opportunities that my father and mother felt I should have and we should have in this country. You often hear about uh, a child that is the first in their family to go to university. I was pretty much the first in my family to go to school. Uh, and when I was being brought up, as you've just heard from Professor Wayne in the 60s and 70s, the racism was overt. It was only because we were different. It wasn't as sophisticated as it is now, sadly, uh, but it was overt. I remember being uh, racially abused as often as you could possibly imagine. And I remember going up to my, to my bullies and saying to them, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words will not hurt me. And it worked, because after that, it was only ever sticks and stones. <laughs> And not far from here on the Bristol Road, after, after, uh, when I was at university, I was beaten up by, uh, there's a common theme here, beaten up by uh, three guys uh, who used my head as a football, more um, Brazil than Germany, which is why I live to tell the tale. But, um, but you know, to my great shame, uh, I didn't do anything about it. I felt somehow or other that um, it was something I should live with, we should cope with. My father and mother, God bless them, they thought that we were just visitors here, uh, and it's what visitors do. We don't make a fuss. Uh, absolutely wrong. Uh, that's what, what I've learned, and what I hope that victims and, and witnesses have learned, that you need to make a fuss, you need to challenge that kind of behavior in order for somebody to act differently. Uh, and you mentioned, John, uh, the uh, sports crime conference. I talked in that conference publicly on Sky and all the news channels about how behaviours on the pitch impact on spectators, impact on the wider society. And I got more hate mail than you can imagine. And I remember one in particular. Dear Mr Avzal, we English invented football. Please go back to Wogland. I remember looking at a globe and I couldn't find Wogland anywhere. I found his name and address on a letter, though. And I did something about it. That's what it's about. If you don't stand up to those who want to control you and exert power over you, then they win. And my message to you and my message to all victims and witnesses of the last 15, 20 years is you must stand up. You are the most courageous people on the earth. After the Rochdale grooming case, people said to me, you're really courageous to prosecute this case. I wasn't. The women and young girls who gave evidence, well, they were the courageous ones. I just facilitated their ability to give that evidence. And that was another example, that case and the enormous furore that it caused. You know, the amount of racial abuse I got, uh, I, I'm not on Twitter anymore, so don't follow me, uh, but you know, the amount of racial abuse I got was all about the narrative. The narrative is that all Asians and minorities are the same, yet the man who brought them to justice was a minority. So they couldn't, it damaged their narrative. So they were desperate to have a go at me, and they did. They called, thousands of letters went everywhere, including to the President of the United States, calling for me to be sacked and deported. I come from small heath in Birmingham. I don't want to go back there. <laughs> <laughs> right? But we made the point. My message to you, graduates and, gradu and, and graduates, is it's tough. Uh, and it gets tougher, and it's much tougher now than it's ever been, quite frankly. Uh, in terms of being able to get on the job ladder, et cetera, et cetera. The reality, though, is that, you know, success is not a result of spontaneous combustion. You have to set yourself on fire. You have to go that extra mile. You've got to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's the only way that people are going to notice that you're making a difference. And yes, you must make a difference. No bureaucracy on the world has changed any, anything. It's people that change things. And you individually will change things. I'll leave you with one final story. My journey is because victims come to talk to me about their experience. A woman who I saw several years ago now, I noticed that her wedding ring was not on her wedding finger, it was on the opposite hand and the opposite finger. And I remember asking her why she was wearing the ring on that finger, and she said, it's because they forced me to marry the wrong man. That was her protest. That was her protest because she had no voice. Therefore, it was my duty and everybody else's duty to be her voice. I am absolutely delighted that I've been honored in this way. I'm grateful for the university that gave me my start. I've learned a great deal from what you taught me, Andrew, and others. Uh, I've forgotten most of it. <laughs> the point, however, is that you taught me how to think. Spoon feeding only teaches you the shape of the spoon. You gave me the opportunity to learn and teach myself, and then share that with the people that I work with. My son said to me, why do racists hate you for no reason? I said, I want to give them a reason. Thank you.